They get questioned on a TV show about religion all of a sudden. And Clinton, of course, is a holy roller all of a sudden. Who asked him about it? Was it, uh, where's the clip? I can't find out. 5,000 pages here. Where's the page on the clip? What number is this? Here, got it. <clears throat> on CNN, they were asked by Innocent Cooper about spirituality. Now, here's Hillary first in clip 26. This is a real scream. Listen to this one. I feel very fortunate that I am a person of faith, that I was raised <laughs> in uh, my church, and that oh, I have had to deal and struggle with a lot of these issues about <laughs> ambition and humility, about <laughs> service and uh, self-gratification. Right, you get All the picture. We don't the... have to listen to every word. Okay, got it. No, she says my church without identifying the word uh, Christianity. Notice she doesn't say I'm Christian. Notice she, she ducks it, my church. I'm surprised she didn't say my house of worship. So you might confuse her for a Muslim or a Jewish person or a, a Hindu or, a, or a, um, a Buddhist. She could say my house of worship. Then you could think she's any one of the above. Plug it in. Now they ask the Madoff of the election, Bernie Sanders, about his. Now remember, a few months ago he says, I'm not a practicing Jew. I don't believe in religion. I don't believe in God. I am not a practicing Jew. But now all of a sudden he finds religion in clip 29. Uh, to me, I would not be here tonight. I would not be running for president of the United States if I did not have very strong religious and spiritual uh, <laughs> feelings. Uh, feelings. I believe that, um, as a human being, the pain that one person feels, if we have children... Yeah, if they eat a too big a Columbia America, sandwich, the pain that I feel is a pain that only Mr. Katz himself should feel. That That's what I basically you, believe. That, that if me. I eat a large corned beef sandwich with too much bread and too much mustard, and I have a pickle and I swallow down French fries after it, the pain I feel should only go to the man who sold it to me. That is the kind of religion that I believe in. And that is why I say I am a very religious, spiritual man. So he's the Madoff of the, of the campaign. There's no question about that. And now it's time to go to the callers on the Savage Nation. Wow, look at this caller. This is not true. Is this one true? Robert, on KSFO, you sure this really happened? Really happened to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it definitely did happen. It definitely did happen. Um, it was late towards my uh, time. I only spent a year there. But, uh, wait, wait. No, tell the people what it says. On my call screen aboard, it says, Robert did time with Peter Madoff. Is that true? Which prison was this in? This was in uh, Esco, South Carolina. That's in a lower uh, minimum security prison in South Carolina right next to Savannah, Georgia. So, but you, were you in for financial fraud? No, 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 not at all. Not, not white-collar crime. It was uh, marijuana-related. All right, so you got to rub shoulders with different types, different crimes, and you met one of the criminals, Peter Madoff. What kind of guy was he? To be honest with you, as soon as he got there, he really stuck to himself. Uh, that's the way it is at the beginning, but um, I, uh, I mean, I'm Latin myself. I had a friend of mine who was a Cuban uh, of Jewish faith, uh, but Cuban, and he kind of uh, took to Peter. Um, he made friends with him, but he was also in there for a Ponzi scheme as well. Um, oh, God. Oh, don't say it to approach him. But. Oh, God, that's awful. It's just awful. So did you get to know Peter? How does he feel about his crime? To be, this, this is exactly what he told me. He spoke very negatively of Bernie. Um, and I, like, like you said, I've rubbed shoulders with all types of people. And to tell you the truth, Mike, um, he seems remorseful for what he did. I know it doesn't make up for anything, but he, he seems remorseful for what he did. He's like 68 years old. He's probably 70 years old now. Um, and he has now. Wait, Pe Peter is Bernie Madoff's brother. Is that who he is? Yeah, he was an attorney. He was an attorney, and I think that. But wait, I'm just trying to follow the the characters. Peter Madoff was Bernie Madoff's brother. Correct. Correct. Okay, and he's serving ten years. Correct. Ten years. Yeah, and Bernie's serving 150 in uh, North Carolina, I believe. All right. So you're saying he felt remorseful, but you know, I I don't know how this works. You're in pr you were in prison. White collar crime, fine. Is it the same jungle as it is in a general prison? Meaning that uh, the things that go on in a general prison population happen in the white collar prisons as well. No, no, no. In a, in a, in a, in a state penitentiary like you know the dangerous ones in California, um, it gets real political and real violent real quick. In these prisons, the uh, prison camps, it's drug offenders who are there for less than ten years and people who are there for white collar crime. So there could be violence, but nothing compared to. Uh, the state prisons and higher... Well, the reason I ask is a guy like Madoff, a financial uh, con man, 
How would a general – prisoners might look up to him. Um, I mean, there were a few. I mean, the white-collar guys, uh, and they were, there were a few, uh, you know, uh, investors there uh, and people that were uh, into real estate. You know, obviously <laughs> – The reason I say it is I understand Bernie Madoff is having a good time in prison, that many of the other inmates ask him for investment advice. Yeah, that, that happens all the time. A lot of people there ask for investment advice, legal advice. A lot of Can you imagine that he's a hero in prison to the other cro crooks and criminals because he knows more about how to scam people than anyone else, so they actually look up to him? He's like a scout leader. That's, that's, that's how it's always going to be, but believe it or not, there's a lot of conservative people in prison. I mean, unless, unless I mean, there are most of, I mean, well, most of the white-collar guys, to tell you the truth, are conservative. Uh, you know why. <laughs> <laughs> no, say it like it is. I'm not here to correct what you say. I can believe it because that way they pay less taxes. I get it. So much of the so much of the conservative movement is filled with hypocrites who only want to pay as as few taxes as possible, and I can't blame them. I pay far too many taxes, but unfortunately, it's basically people who want to keep every dime for themselves, and they they're resentful that they have to pay any money. Yeah, there were a, there were a lot of congressmen in there for tax evasion. There was also an <laughs> Asian guy there who owned a, a few buffets. Who was in there for uh, uh, having illegal immigrants working for him, which I know is a big topic now, and that's why I'm a. Uh, I can't. That's a crime in America. Don't they work for Obama? <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. Thanks for the call. Back in a minute. Oh, I, I can't. I don't think my average listener even knows what that means, but. Now, during this period of the Madoff and the housing crisis and the bubble, actually not, not sorry, take that back, not during the Madoff thing, but during the uh, housing crash where the CDOs were raging out of control and someone was trying to blow the uh, whistle on it and then during the uh, Madoff period when someone was trying to blow the whistle on him rather, there was an SEC that did nothing. And if I remember correctly, it was Christopher Cox used to work for Reagan, 16 years a Republican, 17-year Republican member of the United States House of Representatives, a White House staff member in the Reagan administration, a fine man in many ways. He was chairman of the SEC, 28th chairman of the SEC from 05 to 09, exactly during the period that this housing bubble was uh, created and, and crashed out the houses. He was succeeded by Mary Shapiro, S-C-H-A-P-I-R-O, another one who let it all happen, looked the other way, wouldn't listen to the whistleblowers. And I want to ask you something. If you were damaged during the shorting of the housing market and lost your house, we've talked about Madoff investors. I want people who lost their houses during the crash of the housing market to call this show for the next hour, mixed in with all the news, views, and reviews that I am famous for. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation. Talk radio for the thinking person, home of borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. So you gave him your heart too, just as I gave mine to you. And he broke it in little pieces, and now how do you do? So he lied away to It is our number three of The Savage Nation having a spiritual hour on the savage nation and we are talking about a couple of things that are unique to radio these weeks we are not talking about the campaign to any extent a few jokes about the campaign such as the new hampshire uh, show and tell tonight between the communist and the criminal where i said the new hampshire motto of the democrat party should be live free and get high which is funny and then we talked about why you scammed by bernie madoff what happened? Did you know him? Amazing two hours. And then the housing bubble and referencing a movie called The Big Short. Because both topics are related to this election in some ways. And 
I think you could pretty much figure out the ways they're connected. I mean, the, the greatest Ponzi scheme in American history, Madoff, it's happening again. And Madoff as a personality is identical to Bernie Sanders. They could be cousins. They could be from the same exact, they are from the same on you. They're from the same mentality. One became a scammer in finances. The other is a scammer in politics. Three weeks ago, three months ago, he didn't believe in religion. Now he's a religious man. The same exact scam artist. Then you got Hillary Clinton being asked by a, a CNN host, how did you take $675,000 as a fee during a, the, the big religion question? She says, everyone does it. That's what they offered. I, didn't, I wasn't committed to running for president. So it's all related. And I want to, before taking your calls, which we can't take by, the minute I said to you before the hour ended, if you lost your house during the housing bubble, give us a call and tell us what it was about because it's going to happen again, in my estimation. Some people don't even know what happened. But it did happen. How was it when you lost your house? What actually happened? How did you even get a mortgage? Why were they giving you a mortgage when you couldn't pay for it? When I was a youngster and I bought my first house, I had to save my whole life. I saved $9,000, my life savings, to buy a house for $45,000 here in uh, the Bay Area. It was everything I had. I mean, that little house that I bought in Fairfax, California at $45,000 was the biggest thing in my life. But I knew I was getting a toehold in America. I had two young children. I had to get started. Actually, what am I talking about? I had one child at the time. But I had, to, I, I had to buy something. I knew I had to buy something. So it was 20% down is the point. To get a mortgage, I had to put down 20% of the value of the house, period. Not 18%, not 19 and a half. If you didn't put down 20%, you weren't getting a mortgage from a bank. They were very tightly run. Today, forget about it. And then what happened before the housing bubble was they were giving mortgages to people who certainly not only couldn't qualify, they, they preferred if you didn't qualify. They were giving mortgages to strippers who had five, six houses. Everyone was a real estate developer. Everyone thought that they were mini Donald Trump, and I'm not putting Donald down, but everyone thought that they were a big investor. Everyone thought they were a genius in the 70s and 80s. Do you know that? Everyone thought they were a financial wizard because the houses were going up. Okay, people need something to keep themselves going. So we're going to take calls on that and all the news that might pop up or that I've been holding forth. But I want to um, just go off on a little tangent for a second, if, if I might. I was telling the guys that we work with, Robert and Jim, they know how hard this show is for them and me. They know how hard we struggle to create a, a, a fresh show every day. Five days a week, think about this, five days a week you have to come up with an original program to keep people listening for three hours a day. Now, most can't do it, and so they repeat the same show every day, day in and day out the same show, which is why they savor the election, which is why the media savors the election. It's lazy work. The reason that the media is running the election day and night is because it's, it's easy, it's lazy. It requires no thinking. This one said that, and that one said this, and then Frank Schmuck says it's up, down, and this one two points up, and Frank Yeckel says it's down, and Yankel Pippick says it's up, and then according to this poll is that... Well, I can't do it. I, that's not my cup of tea. If you like it, you know you know where to go to find that because it's everywhere. What I'm getting at is it's almost impossible to create a show such as this on a regular basis. This is one of these out-of-the-ballpark shows. I know radio well enough to tell you when it's great, and I know what the audience is reacting to and why. But how I came to this is the biggest story. What a host really has to do to make it fresh every day is you have to step back. You have to step out of it, you have to step back from it, and you have to breathe the air that's out there rather than just reading the news day and night. If you're going to spend your life on the Internet looking at stories, all you're going to do is talk about what's on the Internet, and everyone's going to repeat each other. Oh, the same, over and over. I don't want to do it. I never did. And my original years in radio, I didn't even read. Well, there was no Internet, if you can believe it. You know, There was no Internet when I began in radio in 94. I had to go buy magazines and newspapers and read and think about what people might want to talk about. It's too easy right now to go on a few websites and start reading headlines and think that that's what people want to talk about. I don't think that's what you want to talk about. I mean, if that's the default of radio, fine. That's what people will do. There's a certain audience that will talk only about the, the, the race, so to speak, from now until doomsday. And then after it's over in November, they'll still talk about it. You know, on and on. It's like we're still talking about previous elections. Okay, there's a stock and trade in that. But I have made a decision that I want to do stuff that interests me Otherwise, I'm not going to do radio anymore in plain English. I will not do it. If it doesn't interest me, I won't do it at all. 
And there's another little rule of radio I learned.